This video is sponsored by NordVPN. Tears of the Kingdom is the first game of the series which takes players back to an already explored Hyrule, in a story set several years into the future. However, unlike Breath of the Wild, it includes two additional layers, both above and below Hyrule Kingdom, one being the Sky Islands where Link begins his journey, the other a sprawling chasm spanning all across the land, simply known as the Depths. Of all three layers, the one which interested me the most when playing was the Depths. Little is known about this place other than some tidbits of lore given to us from characters and the environmental storytelling. In this video, I've narrowed it down to seven separate topics, whether they be secrets or unsolved mysteries. This first mystery will be divided into two separate sections as they sort of build off of each other. At this point, I assume that most are already familiar with the connections between the Shrines of Light and Light Roots. For every shrine on Hyrule's surface, there's a light root directly below that spot within the depths. Not only that, but the names of the light roots themselves are the inverse of their respective shrines of light. While Breath of the Wild Sheikah shrines had been solely made to act as a sort of training grounds for the hero, the lore of the shrines of light is a lot more interesting. One of the twelve stone tablets found in the sky goes into further detail regarding their purpose. The text itself is a bit difficult to make out, although Wordsworth will give Link a TLDR of his own interpretation of what the tablet says. Apparently, shortly after Raru founded the Kingdom of Hyrule, he and Sonya constructed the Shrines of Light to seal the monsters away so that they could never be revived. But if the Shrines of Light were built to specifically eradicate Hyrule of monsters, it makes you question whether the Light Roots also had a purpose. Since they're directly connected to the shrines, perhaps their existence also has to do with this ceiling of monsters. Quick disclaimer, however, that upon rereading the script, I decided to cut back on a bunch of stuff. A big part of it was me arguing that the role of the Light Roots was to maybe seal Hyrule's monsters in the depths, and a lot of it relied on the idea of Gloom already existing in the depths prior to Ganondorf obtaining the Secret Stone. Since we see him use Gloom-like powers with Puppet Zelda, along with the fact that according to the lore of the Secret Stones, it only amplifies one's ability. And this may be the case, but later information leads me to believe that the Light Roots aren't involved in this monster sealing process. Because of the change, this first part's more focused on the surface Shrines of Light, but I'm still going to keep it in as it's relevant to the second part of this mystery. It's also possible that the Shrines of Light and or Light Roots simply purify this evil. Something that's always intrigued me about the Shrines of Light is how similar they look to Raru after he seals Ganondorf. Both of them have that same spiraling green energy emerging from them. As Raru grabs Ganondorf, you can see the gloom sort of being absorbed into him, which I assume is him using his light powers to purify it. Monster Maze also points out how the file name of the structure directly above Ganondorf is a purification unit. It sort of reminds me of that super old theory of mine where we suggested that Ganondorf was the source of ancient energy used to power the Sheikah technology, but that's another topic for another day. In fact, back in October, there was a huge interview which gave us a ton of additional information on the development of the game, along with plenty of interesting lore. Translations provided by Zelda lore and Deepul reveal that, according to Fujibayashi, Raru used his sealing technique to suck the magic power out of Ganondorf's heart and purify it. What is purified and released becomes that spiral light. It also talks a bit more about the Shrines of Light and how they were placed at sites where demons were destroyed. The only discrepancy between this and what's on the ancient tablets is how the former says that these shrines had many evil ones before Raru founded Hyrule, while the latter says that they were constructed after its founding. But that might just be the awkward wording of things. Whenever Link completes a shrine, he's given light which removes some of the corruption on his arm. One way to look at it is that these Shrines of Light are like light versions of Raru's seal on Ganondorf, powered by only a fraction of his power. Not only are we cleansing evil, we're also reclaiming the light power that Raru entrusted into these shrines long ago. That same spiraling green energy on the outside of the shrine is also visible above this altar, and it only goes away once Link obtains the Light of Blessing. It's kind of like we're removing this shrine's power source. It's interesting how Fujibayashi also states that Link is being bathed in the power of the remaining broken demon. And this all leads into our next topic. Deep below Hyrule Castle is where the player finds Ganondorf, sitting atop a platform made up of these root-like objects made out of concentrated gloom. Not only do they look similar to the substance, but coming into contact with them has the same effect as gloom puddles. It saps away part of your life force. Throughout your descent down towards the chamber, on occasions you'll see this same root growing out of the rock. A couple of these roots are present in the room we saw at the beginning of Tears of the Kingdom with all of the murals. These roots weren't present at that time, so we can assume that all of them are Ganondorf's doing, after breaking Raru's seal. 
In fact, all of them appear to be converging at Ganondorf's chamber. On occasions, the player can find similar looking routes within other areas of the Depths Layer, so it's safe to assume that they are connected to that same quote-unquote network as the ones beneath the castle. One you get entry from the Depths also mentions them, although nothing new can be learned from it, aside from the fact that these routes can't be destroyed. But when gathering footage for this video, I did make an interesting discovery which pretty much confirmed that all of these routes were part of the same system. By lining Link up with the direction the routes are pointed and using the map to create an imaginary line, you can see that it points directly towards the castle. I tested this out with a few other routes, and it was the same for all of them. Each line intersects with Hyrule Castle, regardless of where said routes are. Sure, not everyone's going to be happy with the direction of Tears of the Kingdom's story, but it's small details like this that show that the Zelda team still does care. All this to say that the whole network of gloom roots appear to cover the entire Depths layer, all leading back to Ganondorf's chamber. But does this mean that the roots served some sort of purpose? Well, it's possible that this is how the gloom puddles were spread throughout the Depths. Looking closely at these roots, you can see the gloom flowing through them, similar to how blood circulates through veins. And every single route outside of Hyrule Castle seems to be moving away from the structure. Plus, the Yiga entry specifically mentions the gloom oozing out of the suspicious roots, giving more credence to this theory. With that said, the veins connected to Ganondorf's platform appear to be flowing towards him, leading to another explanation. Given the lore, the mechanics of gloom draining one's life force, and how Ganondorf remains here throughout the entire duration of the game, perhaps he was using the gloom roots to drain the life force of all living beings as a means of recovering his own strength. It's similar to Breath of the Wild, as we know that Calamity Ganon had been interrupted mid-revival. Since we have two separate cases where the roots are flowing in opposite directions, it could be neither, or even both. It's also possible that this is why the depths look so barren and without color. Ganondorf wouldn't just be after the life force of people. All living things would be targeted, including the trees and plants. On some occasions, activating a light route will cause vegetation to grow around the location, so perhaps at one time the depths was brimming with life. In a way, you could see the light roots as the polar opposite of the gloom roots. First reason is obviously the fact that both seem to be born from the opposing forces of Raru's light power and Ganondorf's gloom, but as the name suggests, these light roots dig into the ground itself, possibly connected to all the other light roots in some sort of underground network, just like the gloom roots. You can even see the light flowing downward into the ground, not only meant to light up the surrounding area, but to also purify the gloom roots deep beneath the ground. Another interesting detail comes from the dive down to the final boss platform, where we can see these gloom roots converge into a giant, demonic-looking tree. There's also a third type of root found in abundance throughout the depths, although these ones are made up of stone. If we go back to our previous Yiga entry, there's this one bit that sounds like it's talking about these roots, but the wording is a bit awkward here. It kind of sounds as if the first and second bit are referring to the same roots. However, the Japanese version does a better job at differentiating these statements and confirming that the first part is talking about the stone roots. First off, it confirms that these are supposed to be tree roots of some kind, although their strange appearance is rather mysterious. It might be connected to the light root network, or it's a third type of root that's not related to either the gloom roots or light roots. Assuming that's the case, these might be fossilized roots. Or perhaps it looks this way because of the gloom draining its life force. However, the origins and or purpose of the light roots, as well as Ganondorf's gloom, continues to be one of the depth's most interesting topics. There's plenty more mysteries and secrets to come, but before that, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, NordVPN. Whether you're shopping online this holiday for gifts or working from home, you can never be too safe when on the internet. And by going to the link in the description, nordvpn.com slash nintendobc, you'll get an exclusive discount plus four extra months for free. Using the internet without a VPN comes at a huge risk. All it takes is a single misclick on a suspicious website or connecting to an unprotected network for all of your information to get stolen. What a VPN does is encrypt this data, meaning that even if you do accidentally join an unsafe or malicious network, the data you input will remain secure. Things like banking information, passwords, or home addresses. Up to six devices can be used for a single account, including things like phones and or computers, and with the holiday season, now's a better time than ever to get your friends and family's personal devices secure, especially if they decide to do some last minute shopping on Amazon. It only takes a couple clicks to set up your device, allowing you to choose from over 5,400 servers located in 60 different countries. There's a 30 day money back guarantee, so make haste and grab this deal while you still can. That's nordvpn.com slash N-I-N-T-E-N-D-O-B-C.
While the depths layer of Hyrule is filled with monsters and gloom, it's also where the player can find Zonite, a strange looking ore that, as you'd guess from its name, was mined and used by the Zonai. The in-game description of Zonite states that ancients extracted energy from this ore and refined it for the crafting of weapons and armor. Almost all of it is located within the depths, the rest either found in chests or on the Great Sky Island. According to one of the Forge constructs, most of the ore is processed into Zonite charges, which power the ancient technology, including the constructs. This includes the crystallized charges used to create energy wells to extend the duration of Link's battery, described as a solidified form of Zonite charges. Fun fact, if you look at the smoke from the chimneys of the furnaces processing Zonite, you can see a sort of shimmering particle effect emerging from the smoke. Perhaps it's some of that energy leaking out from the processed charges. It's likely that this ore is the reason the Zonai were so involved with the Depths, and if this place is meant to be a dark world of sorts, maybe the Zonai's obsession with mining Zonite inadvertently led to the increase of gloom or monsters, although that's mostly speculation on my part. Zonite only appearing in the Depths could also mean that it's some sort of byproduct of gloom coming into contact with light powers, which I've seen a couple other people also mention. Regardless, the name given to this ore is a clear indication that this race was the first to discover and make use of it. But on occasions, you'll even see Bokoblins mining this ore, and defeating any sort of monster within the Depths drops some Zonite upon death. Meaning that Ganondorf himself seems to have an interest in this ore. The question is, why, and what was it going to be used for? The first thing that comes to mind is the Yiga Clan. Throughout the game, we learn that Master Koga is in search for crystallized charges in order to enact some sort of plan involving Ganondorf. However, while the Yiga have always pledged allegiance to Ganon, it doesn't mean that they're working with him. If the two were coming up with some sort of scheme, the first assumption would be that the monsters were mining Zonite for the Yiga. One of their logs goes into further detail about this. For one, it's worded in a way that shows that the Yiga clan have no involvement with the mining of Zonite. Second, they seem to be unaware of the importance of the ore, aside from it being exclusively found in the depths. Since we don't know when this entry was written, perhaps it was this curiosity which led to further research into the ore, later concocting a plan to collect the crystallized charges. Either that or the Yiga did so without ever realizing the significance of Zonite and its connection to crystallized charges. Originally, Koga's plan was to obtain the auto-build ability, however he later switches gears, instead plotting to restore an unstoppable weapon to present to Ganondorf. The unstoppable weapon is revealed to be a Zonai construct, not unlike the one built in the Miniru quest line. So we're given a clear conclusion as to what their plans were, which leads to the inevitable question of, if the Yiga weren't working with the monsters, what exactly was Ganondorf's end goal in mining Zonite? The simplest answer is that he may have wanted to harness this energy for the same reason he seeks out the Triforce. It's a source of great power that he desires. There's no real reason for it other than making him more powerful. I mean, Zonite is said to be one of the reasons the society flourished in ancient times. Another idea is that perhaps he wanted to study it to understand how it works so that he could corrupt their technology, similar to Breath of the Wild. The only time we ever see his gloom possess a construct is with the one at the Spirit Temple. But that's if we only focus on examples of gloom possessing robots. The entire Elden questline revolves around the corruption of Gorons, presumably due to the powers of gloom. Since another one of these machines appears in the Koga's questline, it does make you wonder if the two are related, although it's assumed that the factory was built to mass produce them, so it's more likely that the three of them we see in Tears of the Kingdom are all separate machines. The wording of Master Koga suggests that the construct he used was already built, requiring only a power source, and according to Minoru, the one taken over by Gloom was originally built by her. It might even be why she couldn't reveal herself until later. Ganondorf may have also wanted the Zonite to deprive them of resources so that they couldn't fight back with their technology. One idea I found when browsing a Reddit post was that these monsters were mining the ore as a means of food. I mean, the only plants within the depths include things such as bomb flowers, puff shrooms, and muddle buds. It would explain why everything in the depths drops Zonite upon being killed. Lastly, it's also possible that this is a dropped plot point which at one time was meant to go somewhere. Sure, you could argue that the monsters mining Zonite was purely for aesthetic reasons, but I find that unlikely. It seems intentional, at least in my opinion.
Before I dive into this next mystery, it's worth mentioning that I've already covered it in its own separate video on the channel, so if you want to see a much more thorough analysis of it, I'll have a link to that upload in the description. What's by far one of the biggest mysteries of the depths are the Bargainer statues. These entities are similar in nature to the Goddess statues or Horn statue. Two are located on Hyrule's surface, one at Lookout Landing, the other buried within the rubble of the Great Plateau. According to the statues, their job is to return Poe's to the afterlife. Any Poe's Link collects on his journey can be exchanged for a variety of Depths-related items, as well as certain armor. However, there's a lot of questions surrounding these entities, along with some interesting tidbits of lore. For example, when you compare the Depths map to the surface, every single giant goddess statue is paired with one of the Bargainer statues. More specifically, the Springs of Power, Courage, and Wisdom, the Forgotten Temple, and Great Plateau. And while this last one isn't related to anything on the surface, it's actually directly beneath the goddess statue in the Temple of Time's Great Sky Island. Uh, I mean, Great Sky Island's Temple of Time. Things get stranger when you look at the A Call from the Depths questline. Not only is this entity capable of giving the player a heart container or stamina vessel, but it even has the ability to speak through the Temple of Time's goddess statue. It's rather unsettling when you really think about it. I mean, we have quotes stating that the voice which talks to Link is the goddess herself, so whoever this is that's possessing these statues must be a powerful deity of sorts. The first idea that comes to mind is that these Bargainer statues are this game's version of the Grim Reaper, a personification of death. And with so many similarities to the goddess statues, this thing might be a polar opposite of sorts. A great point brought up by Shintaku is that in Shinto, gods are capable of making a secondary copy of themselves called Bunshin. While these are still part of the main god, they are also considered to be separate entities, which would explain why there are so many similarities between the Bargainer statues and goddess statues. Another big question is whether these entities are good or evil. The Bargainer statue located beneath the Forgotten Temple has a monstrous-like face on its back. A Yiga entry also states that this statue pulls out the souls of anyone who comes close, implying that these statues are actively killing people. But not only does this entry immediately write it off as a mere rumor, but in-game dialogue also suggests that these statues have a neutral sort of stance on morality. Another great point made in the comments section of my video was that perhaps the one who started this rumor saw a stray arrow hit a Giga Clan member and assumed that it was the Bargainer statue that killed them. Another theory that I loved comes from user Ankeener. They believe that the reason the Bargainer statues need to return Poe to the afterlife is so that they don't become a problem. Perhaps the accumulation of these spirits is what leads to them transforming into ones in games like Ocarina of Time, which are described as concentrated hatred. The last interesting thing about these statues comes from one of the armor sets they sell, specifically the Depths armor set. The more statues Link discovers, the more pieces become available to purchase. Equipping this outfit gives Link gloom resistance. Visually, the hood of the set is very similar to the one on the Bargainer statues. Some parts of the texture also resemble markings on the head. One theory is that this armor was once worn by a group of people who helped in gathering Poe's to offer to these statues. Some also believe that they may have been evil since the outfit has monstrous-like designs on it, not unlike the sinister-looking face on the statue beneath the Forgotten Temple. Lastly is this outfit's relation to gloom. It goes beyond merely having built-in gloom resistance. One other item which offers this buff is the Dark Clump, a pulsating mass of some sort of pitch-black darkness. It's bound together by a strange-looking cloth and what appears to be a talisman-like object. Since this item drops from Gloom Spawn in Phantom Ganon, it's possible that this is a clump of monstrous energy. And when you look at this part of the in-game texture, it's the exact same as the one on the Depths outfit trousers, aside from the addition of these engravings. So maybe the reason this outfit provides resistance to Gloom is because it's made with the same materials that make up the Dark Clump. We may not know everything about these mysterious statues, but in my opinion, this is one of the most interesting bits of lore that Tears of the Kingdom introduced. Within the depths are several interesting landmarks, most of which mirror ones on Hyrule's surface. This includes the abandoned mines found all throughout the chasm, all named after their respective regions or settlements. There's even one directly beneath the Great Plateau named the Great Abandoned Central Mine. These structures date all the way back to the founding of Hyrule, built as a means of processing Zonite to power their technology. And while it makes sense to name these based off of their location in relation to the surface, it makes you question why there's a mine beneath Terrytown called the Abandoned Terry Mine. That's because Terrytown is only established after the completion of one of Breath of the Wild's side quests. So how can there be a mine named after a settlement that, at that time, never existed? 
At first glance, this could be written off as a plot hole, and while that may be the case, let's go over some other possible explanations. Believe it or not, Terrytown isn't the only location where this problem arises. According to the lore, both Kakariko Village and Zora's Domain also weren't around at the time of Hyrule's founding. The former was established after the Sheikah's banishment, and one of the Zora Stone monuments states that the domain was founded 10,000 years ago, around the time of the creation of Sheikah technology. Well, let's take a look at how Tears of the Kingdom handles its time travel. Many stories which use this plot device follow the rules of, by changing the past, it alters the course of the future. In Ocarina of Time, Link leaves the adult timeline at the end of the game, not only splitting the timeline, but also creating a reality where there is no hero to defeat Ganon, leading to the events of Wind Waker. Tears of the Kingdom is different in that it's a closed loop. Everything that happens is destined to happen. When Zelda goes back in time, she doesn't change anything that happens in the future, rather she's merely playing her part in Hyrule's history. A fact that Raru doesn't seem to realize as he states that the reality Zelda came from was different to the current one. He thinks that her being there will change the outcome when all it does is seal it. The existence of murals alongside ancient tablets, which even reference Zelda, are a few examples of this closed loop. So it's possible that during her stay, the princess told Sonya and Raru about her own kingdom in her own time, including details such as the establishment of Terrytown along with other settlements. In fact, many have already pointed out the similarity between Zonai and Sheikah technology. Recall that the Pura Pad also went back in time with Zelda, and that Minoru tinkered with it to restore some of its functionality. So perhaps this is yet another example of the closed time loop effect. The technology of the Sheikah is brought to an era before it was made, which inspired some of the Zonitech later acting as a foundation for the Sheikah devices, only for Zelda to again go back in time, and thus a loop is born. Not to say that the Zonai weren't already making advances in technology, obviously the ancient constructs were around before Zelda traveled to this time. But we did previously discuss the fact that the purification unit above Ganondorf is clearly based on the Sheikah design. Another idea is that all of the mines named after towns and settlements are actually names that Link himself comes up with. Something that supports this is the fact that the only time these mines are ever referenced is on the map. Kind of like how in Breath of the Wild, the only time Zonai was ever mentioned was in the name of the ruins surrounding the Spring of Courage. In fact, after looking through a text dump of Tears of the Kingdom, the only mines mentioned by the constructs are the ones which are named after their respective regions. These are also the only ones the player visits in the quest line with Master Koga. These ones might have been built sometime later, or never had names to begin with. It's also possible that, while locations such as Zora's Domain or Terrytown never existed at this point, that there were previous Zonai settlements in similar locations. Recall that in Breath of the Wild, there's a goddess statue within Terrytown long before its establishment, which would make sense if at the time people had lived there. But, as always, this remains a theory. At first, the inclusion of Don Dons in a video titled Unsolved Mysteries and Secrets of the Depths sounds odd, although believe it or not, there are many things about these creatures which may point towards them originating from the depths. With that said, know that everything we'll be talking about from here on falls under theories and speculation. According to Sima, the Dondons were a new animal species discovered by Princess Zelda, with only five known to currently exist in Hyrule. She established a sanctuary for them to live in, just across from Faron's lakeside stable. Zelda is even said to have ridden these creatures on occasions, leading to rumors of the princess riding a beast. Although in reality, the Dondons are much more gentle in nature. Only five of which are known to exist in Hyrule, all originating from the Faron region. However, one unique trait of the Dondons is their ability to consume luminous stones and produce a variety of ore. Everything from flint and amber to more rare gems like rubies, sapphires, even diamonds. Not only that, but another quote from the Horse God states that the Dondons are ancestors of the horses. Same goes with the Japanese translations. But what evidence is there linking these creatures to the depths? Well, in the first teaser for what was at the time known as the sequel to Breath of the Wild, Link and Zelda are shown exploring some caverns, the latter riding a massive creature. It's not one-to-one -one with the Dondons, although most people assume that this is an older design of them. This already acts as a sort of connection between this prehistoric creature and the underground, but we're going to need something more conclusive. The second detail linking both comes from the type of ore it produces. At first glance, nothing looks out of the ordinary here. We see an opal, diamond, ruby, and sapphire. But there's also a piece of zonite. It's kind of strange to see it here since, for one, this item is exclusively found within the depths layer, the only exception being the Great Sky Island. 
Plus, I've never personally gotten Zonite from the Dondons, so either it's a super rare drop or it's simply not possible. If anyone has gotten Zonite from this, then feel free to comment about it below. With that said, Sima specifically says that the ore and gems on the table were obtained from the Dondons, so even if it's not one of the in-game drops, we can assume that they do in fact produce Zonite. Again, this suggests that these animals came from, or at the very least, have some sort of connection to the depths. Another unique trait of the Dondons is the fact that parts of their body glow during the nighttime, not unlike the Luminous Stones. And considering the fact that their diet consists of only Luminous Stones, it can't be a coincidence. Perhaps that glow is some sort of evolutionary trait the animal got over time because it only eats Luminous Stones. Maybe it has to do with the fact that their environment is almost always dark, assuming that this creature did live in the depths or dimly lit caverns. Much changed between the initial teaser and final version of Tears of the Kingdom, but one thing that remained were the numerous glowing rocks and the cave systems leading up to Ganondorf's ceiling chamber, a rock that many have theorized to be Luminous Stones. Even some of Tears of the Kingdom's caves have massive deposits of Luminous Stone. You can find this ore on the surface, but assuming that the Dondon's diet solely consists of Luminous Stones, it wouldn't be nearly enough. But it's also possible that these rocks are somehow related to Zonite, as that has a similar glow. Plus, Luminous Stones only glow during the nighttime, regardless of whether it's in a cave or on the surface. As I said at the start, their connection to the depths remains a theory, although I felt it was interesting enough to include here. Our last mystery involves the numerous statues scattered across the depths. These act as a guide of sorts, leading the player towards numerous abandoned mines, all of which are part of the Master Koga questline. The first statue type you come across directs Link to the Great Abandoned Central Mine, but there are four other variations of the statue, all pointing towards the mines of the Rito, Zora, Gerudo, and Gorons. The appearance of the statues clearly based on each race in ancient times. However, many have pointed out how strange the first statue looks, going as far as to compare it to Skyward Sword's Magmas. And while the similarity is probably just a coincidence, what race is this statue depicting? The most obvious answer is that it's a Zonai, but even then we're making plenty of assumptions. Plus, these statues lack features such as their iconic, pointy, elongated ears. When Joshua talks about the mural excavated from the depths, she brings up how the figure at the front of the building must be a Zonai, given the long ears, but only describes the others as figures. So are they perhaps a separate race, or are we digging too deep here? Well, remember that not all Zonai are similar in appearance. There's a huge contrast between the designs of Minoru and Roru, and even the statues located deep beneath Hyrule Castle seem to be a lot slimmer when compared to Raru. At one time, there were many more Zonai on Hyrule's surface. With that said, the statues of the Depths still lack those long pointy ears, a detail present on both Minoru and Raru, along with the statues and other mural depictions. But when we compare the appearance to some of the armor sets in the game, two in particular stick out. First is the Miner's Armor set, with its helmet having a similar sort of shape to the head of the figure. And since this was worn by individuals who presumably mined Zonite in the depths, the same place where the statues lay, it further suggests that the ones who wore this armor are the same race. But there's also the Hero's Aspect, the reward for completing all 152 Shrines of Light said to contain the spirit of a hero who once saved Hyrule. In case it's not already obvious, this is meant to resemble the hero who fought alongside the princess and Sheikah technology 10,000 years ago. Like the Zonai, this outfit has a much more primal or animalistic look, but we can't say for sure whether this means the ancient hero was a Zonai. There's a lot of differences between the two, especially since the hero's aspect is equipped with a tail. Perhaps it's the result of a crossbreeding between Hylians and Zonai? Your guess is as good as mine. However, much like the Miner's set, the head of the ancient hero is very similar to the one on the statue. So what if these statues represent whatever race the ancient hero was part of? Who's to say that he's the only one of this kind? Regardless, the statues do appear to resemble this more than the Zonai, but who knows. That's going to wrap it up for this video. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into the depths along with all the secrets and unsolved mysteries it has to offer. I do apologize for the huge delay in this video, but now that it's out in time for the holidays, I hope you all have a great Christmas. I've been Nintendo Black Crisis, and I'll see you all next time.